The patterns of geological formation seen on maps or satellite images reflect not only the 3D geological structure extending into the subsurface, but also how these formations are revealed through erosion. In other words, the topography of the landscape in which they are exposed. We can explore these dual controls to interpret the geology here near the city of Thermopolis in Wyoming on the southern flank of the Bighorn Basin. It's a great area because the geology really stands out. There's little vegetation. So let's go and see what we can find. Running through the middle of the area we're going to look at is this valley with Owl Creek. And we're going to start off looking at this end of the Owl Creek Valley. And on the far side of Owl Creek, we can look at the relationship between the dip direction and the stratigraphic order. So here we are looking slightly more inclined onto that um, valley side and beyond. And we can begin to pick out some boundaries. The relationships here are older rocks in the red streak over on the left going to younger rocks on the right, which is in the direction of dip. And we can illustrate this on a profile running through the landscape along the red line. So let's draw a cross section through here really simply. And we can see the strata from outcrop incline gently into the subsurface, dipping gently towards the right. So the stratigraphic order in here goes from A, the oldest, to G, the youngest, up through the succession. The younger rocks are on top of older, so that the stratigraphic order that we see in the subsurface is reflected in the strip pattern that we see at outcrop. The manifestation of this in the landscape is for a series of scarp and dip slopes, the steep scarp slopes and the more gently inclined dip slopes on the back sides. This is characteristic of dipping strata, especially those with alternating resistance to erosion, in other words, um, strong layers and weaker layers. The stronger layers forming the escarpments or scarp slopes. OK, so that's a very classical view of looking at stratigraphic relationships on maps. Let's spin around. So we're looking down the dip direction now. There's our creek over on our right, and the rocks are dipping away from us going from older to younger as we look down across the dip direction. And we go from these red beds at the bottom here, which are Triassic in age, to younger Cretaceous strata at the top of the picture, down the dip direction. Stepping back, we can look straight down on this landscape now, and we can see the stratigraphic order with that big red stripe being the oldest rocks going to younger rocks as we go across in the direction of the arrow. What we can do now is to confirm the dip direction using a feature called Ving in the valleys, and it's this V shape of outcrop that will tell us the dip direction or confirm the dip direction. And we're going to look at that area just below the arrow head. So let's zoom in on that ground. Some really classic landscapes in here. And here are some horizons picked out in the landscape, forming a very characteristic V shape. Let's spin around this and have a look. So here we are looking obliquely into the V shape pattern, and we'll just take it away and spin around the landscape. Looking into the valley section, which is flowing away from us towards the top of the screen. Looking into the valley again, which is going up towards the caption and looking side on here. So now we're looking straight down on this landscape as though it was a geological map. We can just pick out the valley. There's the line of the valley running off towards the top of the image. And we can now trace on the geological boundaries that we used in our visualization earlier to show the map pattern as we trace the units in from left to right form this really characteristic V-shape, the V closing in the direction of dip of the strata. So that is the dip direction. It's a really classic tool for using outcrop patterns to tell us the direction of the stratal dip. 
OK, we can now use another tool for this, which is the same sort of relationship looking at the outcrop pattern for incised formations. And we're going to use features called flat irons. They're between these arrows in that slightly beigey green unit that we can see in the middle of the image there. Let's zoom in. Here we go. And the flat irons are these features here. Let's spin round and look onto them from the direction the arrows are pointing. So here we are looking onto the back of the flat irons, looking through to older rocks that lie beneath. We can see how this landscape is manifest here with a series of hill slope valleys incising like that and a series of ridge lines which separate the hill slope valleys like that. And it's those features that form the morphology of the flat irons. Let's spin back out and we can pick the boundary. Here's the geological boundary between units on top on the right and those stratigraphically underneath on the left. And essentially, the contact between these forms a plane cutting back into the countryside. The piece that you can see coloured in here is now eroded and it would go beneath the geological boundary that's picked out by the thick black line. And the strike is shown by that symbol and the dip in the direction of the triangle. Dipping back under the flat irons. So flat irons are a really neat morphological feature for identifying dip direction. So let's zoom back out again now and look on this near side of Owl Creek. And we're going to be visualising outcrop outliers. And we're going to look at this area down here. So let's zoom in. Here we go. An outlier is this patch denoted by the X on the image. So let's tilt down and see how it works. And zoom in. So X lies on an outcrop patch with a boundary that entirely encloses younger strata that are perched on a very low hill. We're going to try and visualise this in relationship to its main outcrop trace. So this is the main outcrop trace for the boundary that carries the rocks that lie within the circle. Let's go on a tour around this. So this looking side on, you can, again you can see our outcrop patch in the middle of the image and the main outcrop trace picked out to the left. And these two regions, the main outcrop trace and the outlier, are separated by an area of erosion, Y, where originally this continuous layer did continue but it's been eroded out in between, leaving the patch isolated alone. Again, let's go on a tour around this and you can follow this um, missing area, Y, um, as we spin around. So now we're looking straight down on the outcrop pattern. So we have an outlier separated from the main outcrop trace. The blue line shown on this image, which is really quite a complicated pattern, represents a very simple geological structure. The complexity of the map pattern arises because the planar surface is really gently dipping and has been incised by quite complicated topography, little hills and ravines that sometimes mean the geology reveals the younger unit and sometimes the lower unit or one side or other of the planar blue boundary. Outliers are characteristic of this sort of relationship between topography and structure. So let's explore this relationship between the pattern of outcrop and the relationship to topography. And we're going to go back to those dipping panels of rock over beyond Owl Creek. Here we are again. There's Owl Creek at the bottom of the image. And let's look at this escarpment pattern that we've got here. Here are some boundaries. The blue squiggly boundary was the one on the flat irons and they lie further out along the image in the far distance. And I've picked out two other boundaries in here, one yellow and one blue. And the yellow boundary lies in the foreground, halfway up an escarpment. Towards the foot of the escarpment is another geological contact picked out by the green line. So let's look at the intervals in here. 
If we look at the interval between the green and the yellow horizon in here, the outcrop width is really narrow because that lies entirely on an escarpment. In contrast, the separation between the yellow and the blue horizon is very wide if we were to look down on it because it includes a little bit of the escarpment but then a lot of dip slope. So narrow outcrop widths occur on escarpments, wide outcrop widths occur on dip slopes. Notice the complexity of the blue horizon. It's really wiggly because it lies on a dip slope. And the flat irons we saw earlier were a manifestation of that wiggly complexity. So a very quick look at how outcrop pattern is a function of the topography. But now let's look at how it's a function also of the bedrock structure. It's about time we looked at these nice red rocks in the middle in here. So now we're looking down. There's Owl Creek again at the bottom of the image. And we're going to look at these red rocks, which are actually Triassic. They're a formation called the Chugwater red beds. And we just picked out the stratigraphic top and stratigraphic base of this geological formation. Clearly swept around a fold. It's an anticline. The oldest rocks are in the core. And as we've seen, they dip as you go towards the top of this image away from the core dipping off to the top. So it's an anticline and it's an antiform. Look at the outcrop width here. We can contrast the width of the red beds here with this side of the um, antiform where the outcrop width is very narrow. Let's go on a tour to the ground to look at evidence for the dip of the rocks when we go close up. We'll start off here next to that little stream. Here we go, looking side on, there's a track there, which I guess is a jeep track for scale. And let's pick out some boundaries. Look at the complexity in here through the landscape. There's even a little outlier of the green formation at the edge there. And we can nip down to the side to look side on to reveal the gentle dips of the strata. Let's come back out again. So that was representative of the wide outcrop area where we have a complicated outcrop pattern because it's a low, low angle, gentle dip for the formations and a bit of incision and rough landscape. Let's go and look at now at the other limb of the fold represented by the green box there. Looking down on this in here, let's pick out some boundaries running through, veeing into the valley, but very, it's a very subdued V because the dips are quite steep. They're not hugely steep, but they're steep enough to tighten up our V pattern. And the consequence is, because these rocks are more steeply dipping, the outcrop width for the chugwater, red beds and other formations is rather narrow compared to the other side of the fold. So a steeper dip, narrow outcrop width, a gentle dip, a wider outcrop width. Those arrows are showing us the direction of dip away from the middle of the fold structure there. So the dip is reflected in the outcrop width, a wide outcrop width equals a gentle dip, a narrow outcrop width equals a steeper dip. The greatest outcrop width lies down the plunge of the fold. And we can see this side on here, looking at the fold, which is plunging off to our left as the anticline dives underground in that direction. So the chugwater red beds would go into the subsurface if you went further left, or as you go further left in the image. Outcrop width controlled by the dip of the beds. So a quick tour of this landscape around Thermopolis. It's a really great area for exploring these relationships between outcrop patterns and structure and topography. The Google Earth application allows you to twist the image around so you can get side-on views to get an appreciation of the dip magnitudes and the dip directions to build up a 3D understanding of the rock structure. What it tells us then is that we can use the geometry of layers and to see how they project into the subsurface. And we can do this through understanding the relationship between outcrop and topography together.